Hello, it's Nansen of Adam Northpool. Today we'll look at another research article, this time about central bank digital currencies. And uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So, uh, IOH came in a paper about a privacy enhanced, regulated, and distributed central bank digital currencies, or PARADI. And uh, before we uh, go into all the details, uh, this is going to be a fairly short uh, overview. I'm not going into all the details, I'll be discussing it a bit more principle, and uh, I will be discussing how this is actually a way to try to uh, uh, increase freedoms and rights and give more privacy. Because usually the debates about CBDCs or central bank digital currencies revolves around uh, this dystopia where, um, as they say in this uh, abstract as well, where where these central banks uh, almost becomes like a pan panopticons or uh, that they are um, all seeing, controlling everything, seeing every single transaction. Uh, there's no privacy, uh, everything is controlled. Uh, and this could be a future for CBDCs if we do not pay attention and promote and encourage the solution that try to give enhanced privacy and try to meet all these regulatory demands, but at the same time trying to increase freedoms for users. So that's that's something very important to keep in mind and uh, what, what are these um, regulatory issues well mostly it's four things uh, as they say in the start here they point out to the three things know your customer anti-money laundering and uh, combating finance of terrorism and also for larger uh, transactions there's also know your transactions uh, that have more like, regulatory demands so they propose in parody that um, they will fully address all of these issues and they will also make sure there's no single point of failure and they will do this while enhancing privacy <laughs> not a small feat if uh, i may say so i like a lot of this article i do have some questions or maybe even criticism so uh, it's a very important uh, issue for me uh, is uh, to make sure we uh, we use this new technology for more good than bad so uh, yeah let's uh, look into a few of the details i'll try not to be super detailed but uh, but details that matter for the discussion and uh, to do that we need to know how this works um so uh, one of the distinguishing characters of uh, these CBDCs uh, compared with cryptocurrencies is that in mon is that you separate uh, the control. So the monetary policy is in control of the central bank, and the rest of the exchange system uh, is controlled by the banks. In cryptocurrencies. Um, you could also in the genesis for example of a cryptocurrency or when you vote you can also set monetary policies but in cbdc's you want uh, this control to be at the hands of the central bank uh, as they say here the integrity and soundness of the former remains in the purview of the central bank um, of course there's nuances to this that doesn't mean that the cbdc will be fully in control by the central bank and as we'll see it's really the maintainers who will do all of the verification and uh, audit uh, of everything in this system um, one common concern is that as we discussed initially that the cbdc's uh, could transform the central bank into a panopticon and um, hope I pronounce it correctly that is continuously aware of all transaction data and this is something they want to avoid so uh, they try to make sure it's a uh, privacy enhancing and they need um, and they discuss that this privacy in, is interfered with in three ways uh, or they even mention the fourth so uh, in compared with know your customer it requires the positive identification of counterparties and in anti-money laundry requires the source of funds that they are legitimate 
and in combating financing of terrorism that the recipient of phones should not engage in terrorism. So, and in know your transactions, there's even further regulatory requirements. Um, it's one important distinction in this implementation of a CBDC is that in parity, the encrypted ledger maintains separately by each maintainer. Transactions are identified by transaction identifiers and leave encrypted fingerprints in the ledger of each maintainer that under normal circumstances are completely opaque. So you know the transaction is there, but you cannot see the details of the transaction, basically. And it's um, all of the different banks that will be usually the maintainers that maintain this uh, ledger separately. And uh, as we will see, uh, it doesn't have to be like um, uh, synchronous between all of the maintainers when you do operation. Um, transaction centers and receivers independently update their private accounts leaving the above traces were only in the case of a transaction abort, the maintainer needs to engage in an agreement protocol to ensure consistency. So there's a separate uh, ledger updates, but only when you are using the function of aborting a transaction, you will need maybe to have more maintainers to, to agree uh, on the status of the different ledgers. In this way, Parity offers a digital equivalent of physical cash payment do take place uh, with double spending prevention without anyone in the system becoming aware of the precise value transferred or the counterparties involved. At the same time, and contrary to physical cash, I think this is not correct, <laughs> uh, the transaction value is subject to constraints in terms of sending and receiving limits of the two counterparties and the maximum transaction size. Because I, why do I say I don't think this is strictly correct? Because there's also this type of transaction uh, value limits and constraints in fiat money. For example, uh, there are limits how much you can withdraw in a single transaction, usually in banks. There are limits how large a transaction you can send without uh, additional requirements. But I'm sure they mean it like strictly... Um, in the way of um, having this uh, double uh, spending implementation without anyone in the system becoming aware. Um, yeah. So, in the summary, you can see some of the more details. They are perhaps the first that offers a fully privacy preserving and comprehensively regulated CBDC that is also modeled formally. They review the compliance uh, from the regulatory in the context of payment system. So KYC, AML, CFT, and know your transactions as well. And as we will see about this Byzantine broadcast or agreement, it's not really needed in this system for all of the maintainers. So let's say it's three maintainers and two of them needs to involve in a transaction. You don't need to broadcast it. That's my understanding of this, at least, to all of the maintainers. Only the one that's needed for the transaction to be updated, so it gives an optimal communication pattern and message size, basically. Um, they introduce a novel and also simulatable, so you can do calculations and simulate it in advance for traces, tracing suspicious user in the auditing protocol. And it's so important that you have this simulation as well, because this matters, like the standards you set for when you should require auditing is hugely important for how well a system preserves privacy. We, they also describe how uh, CBDCs uh, can facilitate additional features, so supporting also this Know Your Transaction operations as well. Uh, one important uh, thing here is that this does not necessarily need to be used for central bank digital currencies. It could be also used for stable coins, or I can also imagine it can be used for merchant systems. It doesn't have to be stable, the coin even, but uh, just the fact that you can uh, abort or change or uh, cancel an operation, like 30-day uh, guarantees, uh, stuff like that. Uh, it's uh, really 
it really opens up a lot of different payment options and it doesn't have to be a central bank to that is issuing this as well so it's a system that can work for for many things um so as we said in the this paper the, with the cbdc it's really a central bank but it could be other entities but they are the ones that uh, issues the digital currency. You have maintainers in this system. It will usually be financial institutions such as banks. And then you have the users and the payment interface providers, for example, merchant systems. And they are, there's a sender and a recipient. And then they detail a bit about the security requirements. So fiat and also digital currency have some limitations uh, and for me this is the first time i think about criticizing a bit like could we do better than this uh, the first thing they suggest is that they need to have balance limits so uh, it limits how much of phones that a particular user can possess in a specific period of time this is not something new we have this in fiat systems uh, and uh, yeah, it is valid that there are research that balance limits can prevent bank runs and evasion of wealth tax. But, and here's the key thing, when we now will be able to implement better auditing that at the same time is better at pre uh, pre preserving privacy, why do we need to have all of the limits of the legacy systems? Would it not be better to have even stronger routines on the auditing part instead of putting all of these limits on users. But this is not uh, something that is IOH case uh, discussion. They are just trying to implement a technology to suit the demands of the banks. But my question is more to the, the, the central banks and the banks that want to implement this. What should really think about? What are we sacrificing? And uh, is it possible to to go without these sacrifices and still have uh, prevention of bank runs and evasion of wealth tax? And um, there's also receiving and sending limits. And the argument for me would be the, exactly the same there with this, all of these new auditing possibilities. Do we really need these artificial limits? And the same goes for know your transaction when they're larger than 10,000. And they have built in this uh, option to be able to limit the value of each transaction. And uh, yeah, again, I, I'm stuck with the question, do we need, really need to make these sacrifices in, in such a system when we can have a better auditing of it? And that brings us to the next part of the security requirements. You need to have auditability. And uh, to do that, you need to be able to revoke privacy. So given an anonymous transaction, you can reveal this, who are the identities of the involved parties. And you need to have the possibility of tracing. So uh, when you reach some form of threshold that you can actually also trace transaction but here's an important part of it how you implement it and how uh, IOH key makes it possible to implement it so you don't need to trace in fiat world you would maybe trace like a lot of different transaction uh, history and see other parties that's not any way involved in uh, let's say counter terrorism financing or uh, terrorism financing and um and why do you need to see them in this system here? And this shows how CBDCs can actually improve privacy if implemented well. You will just see, see the exact transactions and exact counterparties that is needed to understand the transaction pattern. Uh, and that is uh, it's a huge step forward, actually, in privacy. Uh, and this is something they try to do. They try to implement full privacy. They try to implement identity privacy transactional privacy and they also make sure that you cannot link or uh, for tracing the the user is unlinked to previous transaction uh, and yeah uh, to other transactions or previous transactions and the, the transaction itself is unlinkable to to other uh, 
phones uh, used by the current transactions in the past. So it you cannot puzzle together the pieces to understand who are the parties or the phones involved and you need to have accountability and when a user makes a payment should not be able to deny it later there is an obligation to accept the responsibility that comes with a finalized transaction and we have this in the fiat world and um, the beauty here is that you could in many instances uh, show accountability without revealing identity so uh, in my opinion, because you can prove it uh, without revealing the more details about the transaction. So, but if needed, you can also show and who is the identity and uh, and prove, and you cannot deny it later because of how the audit can actually replicate all of the transactions. And this is important for auditability. Um, and then I detail it really, uh, all of the phases like to start up the system, like initializing it, starting with the user registrations, issuing the currency, and here's um, a few interesting points. So, um, of course, in a central bank version of this, we can all uh, discuss like, should you have the possibility to inflate or deflate? Uh, the the value uh, and um, I guess you could say that the, in the social contracts of how most of the uh, civilized world works we are, have accepted to have money that have inflation and that can uh, print and in this implementation they have the what they call the brr, uh, you there are no limits imposed to the funds that the central bank possess so uh, of course, there are other assets that are not uh, inflatory like this, and um, of course, many are, who are in the cryptocurrency is in these type of uh, investments because of these reasons. But for a CBDC, you need to have this possibility. So I, I'm really neutral about this. It's a function, uh, and it could be different for different types of issuers. Um, the other thing and this is uh, actually some strengthening of the rights of the user is in this system implemented by AOHK it's actually the case that the user has to accept uh, the currency issuance so it's not enough that the central bank issue the money and then send it to the account. The user also has to be accepting it from the receiving end. And that is giving a right to a user. Um, one thing I'm a bit uh, curious about is could there be problems with the fact that in this system only main one maintainer can have a register for a user? So if maintainer one bank one has this register user um, then you cannot uh, also register in in another user it seems to be the case uh, and that is problematic let's say data from this bank one ledger is corrupted in some way or there's some uh, let's say this is suddenly an international system instead of just a single government maybe north or south korea yeah who knows in the future what could happen and then one bank rejects the data from other and doesn't let them use it and suddenly this user is frozen stuck cannot be registered in other banks so just something i'm wondering if it could be fleshed out a bit more is this how does it work when the user uh it's checked if it can and cannot be registered in other maintainers to issue currency um so payment is uh it's not like in cryptocurrency where you uh, can send it and the user uh, doesn't have a say it actually is involves both parties so you have to accept and you could revoke and all of these things uh, but you have this uh, auditability as well as we discussed you can revoke the privacy 
uh, if there's a sufficient number of maintainers who agree and I guess this leaves all the power in the hands of the maintainers they set the standards I believe could we do better than this could uh, we have some form of threshold by the protocol itself with objectively agreed upon parameters in advance and only when these thresholds are reached then a quorum of uh, maintainers vote on if it should revoke the privacy or not um, and the same with tracing basically it also requires a quorum of these maintainers or for example financial institutions who will agree that in this case the privacy should be revoked uh, but that's not a criticism, so some, uh, criticism of the research paper, it's more like the standards and how we choose to implement this functionality. Um, and uh, basically when there's a currency issuance, uh, all of the all of the different maintainers are involved but not in all phases as far as i understand it and it creates this unique tag also for for this uh, different issuance and here's a visualization of it uh, for uh, sending and receiving and aborting a transaction um, let's see what's more useful to to mention uh, without going too detailed uh, yeah this part um so, uh, I I really like that it's the details here, I, and I believe if it's correct in understanding, it's quite powerful. So, you can revoke the anonymity of the party or its counterparties. And notice here that it doesn't say that uh, other parties will be revoked. So, for example, in a chain of transactions, if two parties are involved, you can actually just reveal the the parts of the chain that involves the party and the counterparty and leave out all of the information about all the other parties and that's really a powerful thing because it's really preserving more privacy than we did in the past and that's a good thing and that shows that CBDCs can be used for for actually increasing privacy and, and be the complete opposite of this uh, dystopia or this uh, all-seeing uh, controlling uh, entity it can be actually the opposite so it's really how we choose to implement it and how we use these tools um, and one other thing i was uh, a bit curious about is like you can have this pending state when you send and i'm worried about this uh, when it comes to the maintainer threshold so what if suddenly there's uh, not enough maintainers to reach this threshold will it be stuck forever uh, what if um, one of the maintainers uh, refused to participate and goes offline and stuff like this? Could we have transactions stuck forever? How will this be handled? But again, this is probably more standards than the technology itself. I mean, we have to make sure that, that you cannot have like a pending transaction forever, some form of a way to deal with that. And yeah, uh, I think I have one last thing I believe was a bit cool to look at. And that is the, the this blind uh, signature itself. Let's see if I found it. Uh, well, it's not here, but um, basically it's using a... It? Oh, there. Yeah. So the the schema they use uh, for this blind signature scheme is uh, coconut threshold blind signature schema, and uh, I tried to write it here, but with my terrible writing, I think we'll just move over to another presentation to try to explain it a bit more. So yeah, what is this uh, coconut uh, blind threshold? It has to have this blindness pro pro property. It needs to have this unlinkability property. We discussed unlinkability earlier in the article. It needs to have threshold for authorities and there needs to be authorities non-interactivity. So what does this mean? So threshold authorities means it's only a subset of the authorities. In, in the article, it's these maintainers that is required to issue partial uh, credentials for 
credits or transactions sent or received in order to allow the user to generate a consolidated credential. So, for example, if there are four maintainers then on, and two are involved in a transaction, then only those two subsets are required to issue credentials in order for the, to generate and consolidate the transaction credential. Um, it needs to have this um, non-interactivity, so the authorities or maintainers may operate independently of each other, and in the case of uh, Parody, I believe each have an independent ledger, and uh, then do not need to synchronize or further coordinate their activities. So I believe the only case is when you have this abort, uh, abort function, you need to have an agreement protocol between the maintainers that are involved. But apart from that, there's non-interactivity. And you need to have this blindness property. So the you, you issue something without learning any additional information about the pri private attributes. And this is very true in this case. Transactions are opaque. You don't know the details of them. And it needs to have this unlinkability. And it's impossible to link multiple showings of the credential with each other. So both in case of the user and in case of the transaction was discussed in the article. And this uh, coconut threshold uh, has all of these properties while some of the other signature uh, has not all of these properties. It does have some signature size, but it's comparable with others. So it seems like a good implementation to use. And yeah, uh, I think I should end with just the starting and uh, my point with doing this is not to do all of the details of the, the IOH key implementation, but to show how this technology can be used for good and to show that uh, how these researchers are actually trying to enhance privacy, not create the opposite, a uh, panopticon and this dystopian future. So when you read this, uh, or participate in this discussion, try to have a nuanced view of it. Look at how technology also can bring good and not just bad. It's just a tool like anything else. So I think definitely there's a future for these CBDCs if implemented well, and it could actually be something that's a net gain for, for the end user, uh, us people. So thank you for uh, listening to this. And if you want to discuss it, feel free to give a comment about the video.